you put your radio gear in the outdoor shed, huh? It's probably best for everybody. <laughs> okay, now I'm starting to record everything right now, so be careful what you say. <laughs> Dom, I, I will uh, I'll, I'll turn this over to you since you came back, and that should have given everybody enough time to uh, do what they needed to do. So uh, uh, yeah. this is okay. – go for it. Well, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I, I presume some, yeah, all right, great. Uh, we're happy to have tonight a guest uh, speaker, Anthony Luskery, uh, K8 Zulu Tango, lives in Ohio. <clears throat> and he's become quite well known around uh, uh, circles for his articles on all kinds of things. I even got one published in the CQ magazine just last uh, March, I think it was, on the very subject he's talking to us about tonight. It was very timely, and thanks to Stan, uh, that we uh, found out that uh, Mr. Luskery can uh, talk about this subject. But we had just created with the, within the club uh, at the end of last year a youth committee because we realized, looking in the mirror, that most of us have a lot of wrinkles and not too many smooth-skinned youngsters in the crowd. So uh, we we're fortunate to have a, a, new, a new guy. Um, I get his call sign mi mixed up here. Uh, K KY4BA, he's, uh, that's Gordon. Uh, he's on, I don't know if he's on here tonight or not. I can't see. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Hi, Gordon. I don't see the whole crowd. I just see some. Um, and uh, he's stepped up to help be our coordinator, chairman of that committee. But uh, I think we all need to know how to get that started. Um, since we really haven't involved ourselves in youth committee subjects. So uh, we uh, were fortunate to find out Anthony's uh, expertise on this. And uh, I asked him to, if he'd like to speak. And uh, he was very cordial and accepted. And here he is tonight. Uh, so I introduce Anthony K8ZT. Uh, go ahead, Anthony. Well, thank you, Tom. And you got my last name correct, which is a very rare item. That it's almost always mispronounced. You had it perfect. The is the, is correct. That's because um, you told me that already. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I messed it up the first time. So. I, 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 I forget, you know, I do this so often. Uh, this is my third talk this week so far, and I have uh, two more coming up this week. So um, on different subjects every time. So I have to, I, the first thing I have to do is check to see what I'm doing that day. So um, I am the section youth coordinator for the Ohio section. And, uh, I have a presentation that I'm gonna to use tonight. The presentation is the short version, but it's still quite long. And I'll give you a link to the full version because all my slides have links in them. Uh, by the way, this is my grandson, Holden. He is nine and a half. He is not a ham yet, but he did build this little key here. So the whole idea of this presentation is to provide some ideas for, for clubs on working with youth and youth groups out there. Anthony, this yes. is on. We're not seeing your screen yet. Have you shared? Oh, your I'm screen? sorry. I I had it tested it and then I forgot to reshare it again. I'm sorry. Thank oh, you. No, perfect. There, there you go. Let's let's try this again. Here's Holden with his closed pin key. You guys seeing me okay now? Yeah, it's good now. Okay, good. And um, the idea of this presentation is to give you some ideas and resources for youth activities. And um, got one more thing here to fix. There we go. Okay, good. So the whole slide presentation is available at tiny.cc slash Y-I-A-R. And there's about 115 plus slides in that presentation. And there's a number of links throughout the presentation. Uh, I'll show you what the links look like when we get to one. But first of all, this is a quote from Rick Moisten, the editor of CQ Magazine. I write a quarterly column for CQ in addition to the article I wrote on youth. And uh, when you look at the typical ham club out there, you see a lot of gray hair and uh, not a lot of youth typically. So this talk is going to be focused on a broad age group. Basically, anyone under 26 years of age we're going to consider youth for today. Um, but we're going to break that down into three primary groups, students in grades four through eight, high school students, and college students and recent grads or technical school students. And of course, the approaches and focus for each of these different groups is different. 
So even though we're lumping them together to put all these ideas together, I'll talk a little bit some of the, about some of the differences. One of the biggest differences, for example, is when you're dealing with these groups, for the most part, group uh, grades four through eight are really good to work with in groups. Uh, we go in and do presentations to whole classes. And these are not selected kids. This is I'll go in and do a, a fifth grade and I'll do everyone in the fifth grade at one time uh, for a whole day. So it's not where the kids are really picking it out. And we keep this more general. It's more oriented towards radio technology as opposed to getting your amateur radio license. But we do throw in a lot of amateur radio into the process. When you start looking at a little bit older kids, junior high, high school, college students, I find it best to approach individual students uh, if you try and do a scattered approach where you're trying to talk to everyone, it it really isn't that effective uh, as going out and trying to uh, identify the specific students that are most interested. So recruitment is important for this group of uh, students. And sometimes that recruitment can be directed to specific classes or majors uh, where you're more likely to find students that are interested in amateur radio or radio technology. Um, and the stresses are different, whereas we talked about general things with the younger kids, we like to st stress the career paths, the network opportunities, etc. And um, quite often we'll do classes for these age groups. So my historic pathway, just to look at a little bit, um, was shortwave listening. And the four main things that we find most kids get involved in radio if they do it without an outside intervention is either through shortwave listening, scouting programs, a school radio club, which of course is some outside influence, and especially likely is if their family member is a ham. And we can't control that one very easily. So let's look at some of the ones we can control a little bit more. Shortwave listening uh, was very popular in the 60s and 70s, even a little bit into the 80s. But the problem is there's been a great decrease in the number of broadcasting stations worldwide and in the variety of stations that are available to listen to. Hams are also now on single sideband. So simple uh, AM uh, shortwave receivers are of not much use. Before you could take that family radio that had the multiple bands on it, and you might be able to find a shortwave band on there and listen with AM. Um, scouting programs, decreasing number of students of troops and students entering troops. Uh, school club radio, school radio clubs. They're not as common as they used to be. And uh, it's not just radio clubs that are not as common. Many schools do not have as many after school clubs in general. So not just radio has declined, but other types of clubs have declined. Um, my personal experience, I was interested in science and geography, especially maps. I got interested in electronics and radio in junior high. And one of my main sources of information was going to the local pharmacy and buying Communications World magazine or looking at some magazines at school in the library. Um, I played around with a couple old uh, multiband radios that were in our household, but I've convinced my parents that I needed a shortwave receiver. So in seventh or eighth grade, I'm not sure which one, I can't remember for sure. I received this kit that I built, a Graymark regenerative receiver, which I still have, by the way. By the way, whenever you see serif font and a little link icon, that means that takes you out to an outside resource. So when you're going through the slides, they won't be underlined for the hyperlinks. But the problem was I never got a license. I didn't know a ham, so I had no idea how to study to get a license. I was intimidated by the Morse code requirement and had no idea how you could learn that. And the cost of new radio equipment was prohibitive for a uh, young teenager. So this license never really occurred. In 1981, after college and marriage, my wife saw an ad in the local paper for an amateur radio class being held by our local club. And we went together in this was a typical novice class and that really we spent most of our class in the beginning studying Morse code. I passed the novice uh, in 1981 summer, passed the tech in 1981. My wife passed her tech and her novice in 81 also. I joined the local radio club and I got on HF in 1983. So that's my experience. And I think that was typical for a lot of kids about my age. Uh, if we didn't get involved earlier, luckily we got involved a little bit later. So some of the myths of amateur radio and youth, the first big myth is that you have to have a club, um, a school-based club. You don't have to necessarily have a club. Licensing is not everything. Of the number of kids you make contact with, only a certain group are going to want to get their license. And it's not 
a good idea to try and force a license on someone that's not interested. And everyone given an opportunity doesn't want to become a ham. You would think uh, many of us, because of our backgrounds and our interests, we say, well, boy, if I would have just had a chance to do that, I would have jumped at the opportunity. But not everyone does. It's always, uh, it's not always love at first sight. Um, this is a mistake here. It's, it's not always love at first sight. And sometimes it takes a long time. So in my case, even though I got interested in junior high, I didn't get my license until after I graduated from college. And a, another big myth is that high school is the best age to go after. That's actually one of the worst age groups because they're usually busy with a lot of other activities. So it's better to get them before they get into high school or get them after they graduate from college. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have a really strong radio group, but what I'm saying is those kids that would be very strong in your high school radio club, you usually recruit much before that. Uh, some other myths is you must have an outside antenna to be able to receive anything. Uh, my antenna for my shortwave radio was nailed onto the uh, floor, to the uh, ceiling of the basement because my bedroom was in the basement and I had an, not only an indoor antenna, but a subterranean antenna. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about some ways that you can get away from actually having an antenna at all and having a radio at all and getting involved with radio. Um, another myth is that kids need simplified content. Uh, these kids are a lot brighter than you think, and they're very absorbent at this point in time. So they have no problem usually with studying and, and getting the material down. A lot of people think that voice is the preferred mode for demos, and I'll tell you some reasons why a little bit why it's not a little bit later. And a lot of people think contesting is not for kids. Well, if you just watch the kids in the competitive games they play, you'll see very quickly that they like the idea of the competition. And some, some more myths yet. Everything is surface mounted, so no one ever builds anything anymore. Well, we found that our junior high kids love soldering, and we got some simple little kits, and they really enjoyed them. Um, I find that younger kids pre-junior high, those fifth and sixth graders love CW. Um, a lot of people think there's just money all over the place. If you want to start a school club, there is not. And XYZ company will not obviously donate money to your school radio clubs, not necessarily. So let's talk about some ways that you could connect with youth. I already mentioned a little bit earlier about some of the things. Um, of, kids, of course, you go where the kids are at, and that's school for one example, but also um, other youth organizations, scouting, youth groups, community organizations. Uh, local libraries, uh, these are maker groups. These are the type of groups that you might be able to uh, find youth that are interested. The other approach is to directly identify specific kids and approach them, friends and family, social media, uh, a radio club recruitment, uh, professional organizations. This is especially important for the college age group where you might go in and uh, get kids that are in majors that would be very technology oriented. And then a big way is the accident of kids bumping into your field day site. Let's uh, look at schools first of all. One of the first problems with schools is getting your foot in the door. Uh, whether it's a school or with homeschoolers or with scouting or youth groups, community organizations, they're not all necessarily going to be welcoming to you uh, bringing amateur radio to them. They don't necessarily see the benefit of it. So we have to figure out some ways to get your foot in the door. The first thing I want to say is don't dress for a ham fest when you want to go to any of these places and get your foot in the door. Uh, this is not the time to wear your, uh, your custom outfit that's great for the ham fest. You want to dress professionally, talk professionally, and prevent, present a very professional appearance to them. And not everyone in your club is a good candidate for youth outreach or working with students. A lot of clubs make the mistake of assuming that they have people that are doing education typically in their club, teaching general or technician class licenses, and they're the ideal people for youth outreach. And they may not be. They may not have a good connection with kids. They may not have a good connection with schools or other organizations. So they may be the ideal people, but they may not. So you need to be careful in uh, selecting the people that you're going to have uh, as your front-facing group towards uh, getting into schools and other organizations. One of the most important things is that you approach these organizations, what you can do as HAMS to support the activities that they're already doing, not what activities you're going to bring in you. Again, the whole idea is to be able to support the activities that they're already doing. You don't want to think that you're going to cause them to have more work to do. 
especially what you don't want to go in and say, go in and say, look at all the great things we do. Why aren't you already doing this in your school? Uh, you did this before. You had a club forever. Why don't you have one now? All these negative ways are not the way you want to approach uh, to get your foot in the door. One great approach recently is to piggyback on the current high interest in STEM or STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics, and the DIY movement. A lot of schools have invested heavily in this type of thing, and this is a great thing to tie your amateur radio to. So I put together a trifold brochure. Uh, it's called uh, Ham Radio, the Original Maker Movement, and you can download a copy of it, and um, here's the link right here, and the link is not working. There we go. Hopefully that link worked. Let me see if it did or not. Yes, it did. So this is the brochure, and you can print this out, and you can change it a little bit if you want to. You don't necessarily have to have the exact same things. And it's just something that you can pass out, and we do this a lot at maker events or other STEM-type events when we're working with people. We also, it's one of the handouts we have available at our field day site. There's also some handouts available from the ARRL, uh, the 22 things you can do with amateur radio and the DIY magic of amateur radio. Just remember, if you want to use these, order them far enough ahead of time so they'll get there in time. They don't come very quickly, but they are free. Getting your foot in the door uh, for schools. Do your homework. Have a basic information on the K-12 instruction and curriculum in your target school and target grade level. So if you're looking at approaching a 5-6 building, Make sure you have a good idea of what they're teaching in the science area, the math area, and different areas in their curriculum so that you can talk intelligently about how you can tie into their curriculum. Uh, discover the key person to contact at the school. And this is, this is sort of something you have to sort of fill out and figure out because it's not always the same person. Uh, one school, the key person turned, turned out to be the police officer who was assigned to the school. He was a ham already with a real strong background in science. He was a CIS officer in the, in the, for police before that. So he had a very strong science connection and he immediately fit into the science end of things and he was a great way into the school. Sometimes it's a technology person, sometimes it's a librarian, but it can be any person. You just have to figure out who the most receptive person is. Um, have a flexible plan to present so that you can meet their needs and not be painting just one picture. And again, stress how you can contribute to their current instruction with fun, real-world lessons and projects. And uh, one example is the ARIS group, uh, ARIS group, where you can get them involved in space-related information with the amateur radio and the International Space Station. Another, th oh, I'm sorry, that's the school thing. And I'll talk some more about some other curriculum things in a minute here. Getting your foot in the door for scouting. Uh, many clubs already do Jamboree on the air, but are you really doing it in a way that's recruiting or helping out for youth? Not just have the event, but make sure you have plenty of materials for them to have ahead of time so they can get accustomed to them before and materials that they can take home with them. And I have some handouts that are really good for that. Also make sure you have other activities besides just Jamboree on the air radio time because it might turn out the bands aren't that great that day. Or you might get an overflow of kids and you don't have room to have them all talk at one time. So make sure you have other activities that you can do. While we're talking about scouts, one of the most important things is youth protection. And if you're gonna do any program with the scouts, with schools, with youth groups, it's very important that you go, th that you have anyone that's working with the youth population go through a youth protection course. The Boy Scouts of America has a free course that you can use. Uh, you, can you can set up, uh, you have to register for it, but then it's all free to take the course online. There's also other groups, and I, in my main slide show, I have about five other groups. So if you're interested in taking your youth protection training through another group, I have those in the full slideshow presentation. But it's, youth protection is very important, and you need to follow the guidelines, whether you're providing youth activities at a club, at a school, at a home, at, a, at one of your radio club events, or wherever you're doing it. And some of the basic things are always having at least two adults present, never have single adults present with a group of youth. And there's a number of different things. So again, I, very, very important if you're going to work with youth that you do this and that you can tell the school ahead of time, I've went through the Boy Scout Youth Protection Training Program and here's my certificate from the training. A lot of schools will also require you to get an FBI uh, background check or a BCI background check. Uh, 
to be able to work in the school. So you might end up investing $25 to $60 to be able to do that. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things you can do demonstration wise for youth. So I mentioned my fifth to eighth grade activity called Radio Day. And basically what this is, is I would go into a school district and uh, pick the grade. It was typically fifth grade is the group I worked with, but sometimes sixth grade. And we would have a whole day where we'd bring all the class to get all the fifth graders in the school together at one time, if it was a, under 75 kids or so. And we would do all the subjects for their day with a radio slant to them. So for uh, things like math, we would do calculate wavelength versus frequency using inverse proportional fractions. So we were doing a math lesson that they felt was very useful, not just talking about radio. And I'll talk about some more specific exam example of curriculum events. Another type of demonstration might be in a scouting event or a merit badge class or community activities such as field day, county fairs, other areas. These might be places where you're putting on a demonstration. So here's the student radio day information. If you click on the link, you'll see that I've created a handout that goes out that I give to all the students for radio day. And it has a bunch of links on here, which I'll talk a little bit about some of these a little bit later, but these are all links with resources that they can use. But then I also have the phonetic alphabet and a short Morse code sending thing. You're never, you're never gonna get on the air with this, but it's fun to do with a small group of kids. And uh, just the basic idea of a little diagram of what a radio's, what a block diagram of radio circuit. And then some information on radio frequencies, uh, what different frequencies or what different types of operations. Uh, some information on the prefaces for the metric system. Uh, example of wavelength and frequency. And then a nice little electromagnetic uh, spectrum chart. And then the amateur radio band map and a little description here of what to listen for where because we were actually doing these different type of listening activities so they would knew what frequencies we were using. So this is again is available on the link right here. That's for the students. In addition, I have a handout that's for the teachers. And this always goes out long before I actually do that. I go, give this one to the teachers ahead of time. And this has links to the resources on my website on my uh, teacher website and my student website. It talks about what I'm going to be doing, what type of materials I need, whether I'm going to be bringing them or they're going to be providing them. Um, things like I usually bring the maps and stuff with me, but sometimes they have things I don't need to bring everything in. Talk about the top, what, how the day's agenda is going to be. Give them a choice of what they want to pick out. And then these are the different type of content areas. I talked about the math already, but for science, I give them a choice which, which type of lessons they want to do. Uh, some, most of them usually choose the electromagnetic spectrum. Some are more interested in the uh, how radio works. Some are interested in propagation. Some are interested in space. So we'll talk about satellites and orbiting and tracking. So just to whatever they're, they're, they're interested in. Social studies, um, I usually focus on maps, but we talk about different types of projections of maps, polar projections versus Mercator versus Peter projections. I'm sorry, Peterson projections. And so it's focused on social studies, but we bring radio in through that. We can also talk about different governments and uh, different types of geographic locations, etc. Language arts. People always think, well, what are you going to do for radio and language arts? We found out that it works very well to use the phonetic alphabet and the Q symbols to do a lesson on understanding inf information. And uh, those work out very well. There's other options, too. Instead, if they're more interested, we could do a radio drama and do a performance like broadcast radio, from like in the 30s. For music, frequency and pitch, uh, Morse code with drums. That's It's hard to do. You do I have to do uh, high high low notes instead of long short. Uh, Doppler shift is always interested. And for a little bit older kids, we'll talk about MP3s, data compression rates, and different things like that, because the kids are into these things. And we'll talk about, you know, when you have that song on your your phone, what's the audio, what type of audio compression do they use, and what does that do to the signal? So there's a lot of things for even older kids. Art, if we're doing art that day, we might give I might give them a QSL to design. 
I'll show them some sample QSL cards. I'll give them a fake call sign to use, something that usually has a nice ring to it, like King or Gnome or something like that. And then, um, you know what? I can zoom this a little bit. I forgot about that. Oh, too much. I zoom. Okay, there we go. So then they do QSL cards for the location with that they're at. Uh, world languages, we can talk about foreign languages, role of cultures and radio. Then for phys ed, we usually demonstrate wavelength and frequency using jump ropes. There's a bunch of things we could do for tech classes. So there's a whole variety, and I let the teachers pick these out ahead of time, what we're going to do with their specific class. So the typical radio day um, would start off with it me talking to the whole group, using an introduction on what radio is. We'll talk about the hands-on activities. We're going to do demonstrations. You often set up a radio. And as I said earlier, I always provide these online materials ahead of time to the teachers. One of the big activities I've been doing in the last couple of years is using uh, online tunable SDR radios. I have a whole page that I put together about these. And this is the handout that I give the students Many schools have Chromebooks or one-to-one -one computers. So this is a great activity where I can work with the whole class and they can, 20 kids can all be tuning in separate radios at the same time. And we don't have to worry about getting an antenna into the building. Quite, quite often with school buildings, you can't, don't have a good way to get an antenna in the, in the windows because they might not have windows that open. So I put together this whole handout on uh, the Web SDRs group and the Kiwi group. And there's a couple hundred receivers between these instructions on how to use them both the kiwi and the the ws the sdr.org uh, and then a whole section on where they should listen what frequencies they should try to find stations on because i have 20 to 30 kids working at one time so i can't be looking into each one's shoulder so i give them this information so that they're doing that and then i have them log the stations and they try and see who they can find so this is a whole thing, and the whole idea is this is also something they can bring home and do at home afterward. So the whole idea is not a one and done. And this is my grandson again, and the nice thing is they can even do this on their phone. So even if they're not using a computer, it can be done on a phone or a tablet. Um, like to do as many hands-on activities as possible. One of the things we do quite often is build these clothespin keys. For less than two dollars, we can put together the key. And all the instructions are here on this web on this uh, page. And they're basically just a clothespin, some brass thumbtacks, and a 12, 12 uh, 9 volt battery and a computer buzzer. And it shows how you put the whole thing together. And you can even connect two of them in separate rooms if you wanted to and set up a telegraph where they would send to each other. And then they have the chart that has the little quick CW so they can actually start sending their name to each other or things like that and using the decoding chart. Now, as far as demonstrating the radio goes, I usually try and set up an HF radio if possible and demonstrate it. And one of the things that most of the time we do is we tune to a radio and they hear voices. And I get this look from most of the kids like, well, why didn't you just do it on your cell phone? So I find that sometimes a DX station or a foreign station might be of interest, but a lot of times I find it's much better to do something that's visual or tactical. So like Morris code where they can fill the, they can send with their key, um, digital modes that I can display on a map, decoded CW, and it can either be in the radio or software. This is a Kenwood TS590SG, uh, and I'm not sure if most people that have this, if anyone has this radio out there, there's free software on the website that lets you take the CW decoder from the radio and display it on a big screen. Plan your radio operations. Always have maps and charts, map, frequency charts, maps, so that when you hear someone, you can point to where they're at on the chart. Uh, you can show them where you're at on the frequencies. So 
don't limit yourself to just phone communication. Sometimes CW is good if you have a decoder so they can see what's happening. Digital works out really nice, especially because it's the fact that it's point and click and something that they'd be interested in. And satellite communication works very well with the low Earth orbit satellites. The only problem is you only get a few minutes at a shot. So sometimes that doesn't work out. But I always, I usually can say I can't guarantee we're going to get a two-way contact, but you, we can usually hear the satellite when it goes over. We don't have to worry about propagation. So quite often we'll hear it if nothing else. So phone contact, as I mentioned earlier, it's easier for the kids to understand it, but it's something they don't necessarily get excited about. CW, harder for them to understand, but with a decoder, they can see uh, specific things like your call sign going across the screen, things of that nature. Uh, sending them with the CW keys that we made. Uh, digital modes, as I said earlier, things like FT8 and FT4. Uh, the visual appears, appearance is very nice and being able to use things like uh, PSK reporters so they can see where your signal is going to is really, ni really a uh, nice display tool. So here's PSK reporter so that you can actually show them all these places are hearing my signal. Here's some information on satellite contacts. I, I suggest the low, low Earth orbit FM satellites is probably the easiest one to use, and there's tracking information. So the, all these links give you all the information for the resources. Uh, talked a little bit about competition. Unfortunately, you're probably not going to get a chance to do a school demonstration on a weekday, on a weekend day when there's a contest going on. But if you're doing a, something with scouts or something like that, let them listen to you doing a contest and let them look at the online scoreboard so they can see where your score is at in comparison with other people's scores. So the online scoreboards are a real interesting way to uh, get kids more interested. Um, we have an activity that we do with a club that I work with. It's a That's the 5th, the 6th, 7th, 8th grade club. And sometimes we run out of activities for everyone in the club to do because there's 30 some kids in the club and we only have two radios we can use. But what we'll do quite often is we will have uh, different activities. And one of the activities that they find fun is we do a contest with an eyeball QSO party. So I hand out QSL cards. They random they randomly get a card from a stack and then they don't show anyone that that card is. And that's the call sign they're going to use. And they actually yell the call sign out and other people in the room try and hear it. When you get 30 kids in a uh, library all yelling out their call signs and running around. The, the, some of them get real smart and get up on top of a chair so they can get more people to hear them. And it's basically just the same. They have to exchange information. I give them ahead of state, ahead of time, a state that they're going to be in that they have to tell the other kids and uh, a number that they have to exchange. So we do a simple QSO party, but it's an eyeball QSO party. And I have a whole sheet here on information on how to do it. Let me try that again. including a link for the score pages for the log pages you can write, write out. So here's all the information on doing it. I wrote an article on gamification for amateur radio, which you might find interesting. Um, I mentioned uh, visual aids. These are good if you're going to be working with kids quite often, having uh, things like phonetic alphabet in front of them so they know what call sign is going to be used so they can just look at it and have a script so that they can read from it when they're having a two-way contact. So with things like Jamboree on the air or other activities. One of the important things is if you're going to be doing a phone contact with another station, it's really helpful if you don't just randomly find someone. Try and find a good station that's willing to carry out a two-way conversation, has a strong readable signal, and there's nothing wrong with pre-planning or planting someone on the other end. Make arrangements ahead of time so that you know that you have someone. If you can't randomly find someone, you know someone that you can contact at a specific time and frequency who knows how to talk to kids on the air. So there's nothing wrong with having a plant station out there. The kids don't necessarily know. And... It's important then to ask good questions, have patience, minim minimize amateur radio abbreviations and jargon, and talk about relatable things to kids. Don't spend time talking about your antenna or your SWR or stuff like that. Those aren't really very exciting for kids. So have questions planned ahead of time that will be more interesting to kids. It's very important whenever you're doing any type of on-air demonstration that you have alternative plans and off-air activities, either for the fact that you might have too many kids or the bands may be horrible 
or you maybe you forgot a key component to your radio and you don't have it that day with you so you left the mic at home by mistake so have backup equipment have multiple bands available have other modes available i remember one time i was doing this demonstration i had a really good group of, of teachers and kids very excited 75 kids get ready to make a contact in the band is totally dead the k went up to four and everything was wiped out fortunately i had my my uh, interface cables for ft8 and we were able to manage two ft8 contacts the kids didn't know we weren't going to do ft8 they didn't know i had originally planned to do a, a phone contact they were just as excited with FT8 and I was able to squeeze two contacts in when the band was totally dead. I mentioned already the listening activities with the free REX information. One activity that we found, this was our second most favorite activity for our, our fifth through eighth grade students was fox hunting. Um, we would hide foxes around the school and they would search for them and they really thought that was a great idea and they really enjoyed it and we just used these uh simple measuring tape antennas and hts uh, we had someone in our club that built a bunch of what he called fox boxes they were basically little arduinos with a small trans uh, 440 transmitter in it and uh it was programmed so it would send for so many seconds, then be off for so many seconds, then send for so many seconds. Another activity that we were surprised the kids liked was soldering. And what we did is we went to eBay and we bought a bunch of 99 cent kits. A lot of them came with the wrong components and a lot of them were missing components, but the kids really didn't care because their main idea was soldering these components into the boards. And they had a great time and they didn't burn each other, burn themselves. Only the teacher burned his hand. So it was a very successful day and they really enjoyed doing it. Uh, the other thing you can do is we uh, also just tore apart a bunch of old radios and gathered parts up for, for them to use to do soldering practice with. Here's some links on uh, projects for kids, circuits. Uh, one other thing that's, uh, two, two other things that are common to tie into, a lot of schools are into robotics and a lot of kids are into drones. So that's two common things that you can also use for bringing radio into the school. One thing I find very useful is kids like to watch videos. My, nine and a half year old grandson loves youtube and i found that if you can find youtubes that have kids doing radio and it's even better so this is faith hannah and her sister i can't remember her sister's name hope i think is her name and uh, they have a their own little youtube page so after you do spend all this time doing your demos and everything, not all the students are going to find amateur radio interesting enough to pursue further. But hopefully you've made an impression upon a number of them, and maybe a few of them might be interested in going further. So if that is the case, plan future visits. Ask about adding additional school buildings or grades in the same district. If you're successful in one building, you know, have the teachers tell the other school, hey, this was a great project. Can we do the same thing? So what started out as one fifth grade in one school district turned into five fifth grades throughout the different districts, throughout the same district. Provide physical resources if possible. I like to bring in a copy of the Zach and Max coloring book that we print out, the the one that you can color and not the, the color one so it's cheaper to print. And then I provide the library with um, some materials as far as old amateur radio magazines and things like that for the club places we've already established some kids not just the first time visits as far as licensing of youth probably not the best strategy to start with if you go in thinking we're going to go in and we're going to take this group of kids and we're going to license them and make them all hams it's going to be very frustrating for you and your effectiveness is probably not going to be that great you might get them to get their license, but you're not going to force them to become active hams. So instead, you're better off focusing on general exposure. And then when you find a kid that's actually really interested, then go forward and, and plan to do those type of licensing activities. Now that we're doing our licensing activities online, we find it's actually a lot easier for kids to attend a license class, licensing class, and we don't have to set up special classes for kids. 
So we've been doing our classes since last year on, uh, we use Google Meet instead of Zoom for them because we use Google Classroom. As a matter of fact, if you know anyone that's interested in getting their general class license, we have a class starting on Sunday and uh, it'll be for six weeks and it's free. And um, we had students last time from, our furthest away student was in Washington State. Uh, so there's no limitations on where we can have kid, have anyone, not just kids, but anyone come to our classes. Developing active lifelong hams is probably one of the one of our overall goals. That's our little our really end goal is not only to get a kid involved, get youth involved, but get them to be a lifelong ham, not just a one time for a couple months and then be done. So if you plan on doing that, it's very, very important that once you get the kids to get their license, you must mentor, you must provide Elmering for them. You need to provide operating opportunities. They may not have stations, so you need to make sure that they have places to operate. Some of the impediments for class, uh, it's usually hard for youth to find time and transportation for offsite classes. So these online classes have been really a boon for us. Parents are, are leery of unknown classes, instructors, locations. They're not gonna wanna drop their uh, 12 year old off at a uh, clubhouse with a bunch of old men that they don't know for three hours for a class. The long, the long duration classes are difficult for commitment we found that if we have classes that are more than six weeks in length, they're too long, people start dropping out. So we've decided that we go for two to three hours uh, at a time, but we do it for six weeks and that's it. Uh, as far as school radio clubs goes, the key is you have to have someone in the school staff who's gonna be able to sponsor and run the thing. Don't think you're going to be able to do it yourself. You're going to need to have someone in the school if you really want to have an effective relationship with the school. If you do find a teacher that's interested in getting trained, the AWR has something called the AWR Teachers Institute on Wireless Technology that they do every year. Now, last year, because of the pandemic, they didn't do it, but they usually run three sessions during the summer and teachers can apply to attend any one of the three sessions. And they usually have them around different places in the country. They had in Utah, I'm sorry, in um, I think last year, the last time they did it, they had one in Dayton and one in Connecticut and one in California. But if you're interested, there's a link here for information on the Teachers Wireless Institute. Clubs can support a school club with direct assistance with meetings and equipment, licensing classes, monetary support, providing library resources. And I have a whole link list on my other page on uh, different books you might want to donate. And don't think just of donating like a license manual or something like that. There's a lot of good fictional titles that have radio or amateur radio in them that might be of more interest to that reading group. And one strong thing I suggest is that any kids who go through classes with you or any club you're associated with, give them free reciprocal membership in your amateur radio club. It doesn't cost you anything to have them and they feel like they're getting more out of it. Um, as the Ohio Youth Section Coordinator, I'm happy to work with you. And I have uh, a list of youth coordinators from all around the country. So if you do not know who your youth coordinator is, I can help you find out if there is one. Unfortunately, of the 73 or 74 uh, sections in the United States, only about two thirds have youth coordinators appointed. I write a uh, monthly newsletter article for the Ohio Section Journal and I, what I do is I pull my educational articles together and put them in one place so you can see my old articles if you're interested. Uh, this is that handout I talked about earlier and this works out really nice to have at demonstrations, field day sites, etc. And what you can do is you can laminate these and then the kids can actually shoot the QR codes with their phone to get the links. So they don't even have to worry about getting the paper home. Getting the paper home is often the hardest part. And there's fun activities on here. There's also the Zach and Max comic books available on here. The web SDRs that I talked about earlier, building the clothespin key. So these are all available on a one two-sided piece of paper that you can either hand out or laminate and have scannable. This is my webpage, the Kids Radio Zone, which I'll go to here in a moment. I also have an article, the, a, a, a little uh, article that I wrote on uh, amateur radio for scouting materials. 
And I have a new ham guide. This isn't just for youth, but for anyone. This is my radio website. And then I have a talk that I prepared for educational technology conferences, right, where I'm teaching, talking to teachers at these. And it talks about amateur radio for to explain what it is for teachers. These are resources from the ARRL. Unfortunately, there's not in one good place. They're all sort of scattered around the website there. And here's some more youth resources from the ARRL. And again, here's a link to the whole presentation, tiny.ccyiar. And let me go back and show you this one thing I wanted to show you here. So here on my web page, there's one tab at the top that says students and teachers. And if you go down this, it takes you to the different resources. Let's go to the kids radio zone. It'll actually take you out to my school teacher site, my education site. And this is the website for youth for students and it's not just amateur radio i tried to make it have a number of electronics resources general re radio resources space resources so there's stuff here on space and satellites there's stuff here on broadcast radio here's the links to all that sdr stuff i talked about earlier here's the closed pin keys but then here's some, also some computer stuff and electronic stuff here and circuits and diy stuff so this is the kids page, and then there's also a teacher's page, which is similar, but has some more resources that are oriented for teachers. This is my contact information. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and take questions. Hey, uh, Anthony, that's, that was a great presentation. I really okay, thank now, you. Now, that's the short version of it. That's the 60-slide version. When you go to that link, tiny.cc, uh, Y-A-R, that's the 115-slide presentation with more details and more links in it. Yeah, I appreciate that. There's more information there that I can drink at one time, but we'll <laughs> definitely follow up with that. Uh, we have done some little bit of outreach to uh, – youth groups in the past. Unfortunately, this uh, past COVID mess has kind of put a crimp on all of that. Yes. Uh, but typically what we've done in like two, a year and a half ago was uh, things like what we have a local mag lab, mag, uh, high, what is it? High energy magnetic laboratory here in Tallahassee is very special, but they have a, a community day where they sort of have booths and visitors and show and tell and and our ham club sets up for that well, that's i good. think what you've taught us is going to help us take a, a a closer look at what should we be showing there and how is it going to help bring in uh, more interest uh, especially with youth um also we did a cub scouts uh day uh that they have locally in the fall in october uh, and uh, was I kind of accidentally, I sort of ran that one and we accidentally ran into a couple things that were interesting to me after the fact that were like lucky uh, direct hits. Um, we set up a couple of radio stations just to talk. One of them was on 20 meters. So we were talking around the world a bit. And we set up a very simple Morse code uh, practice setup. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the people came through, it was sort of like a, uh slow flow of us a half dozen folks every 30 minutes or so that are going through all these activities out there at the cub scout day the parents would gather over more towards the radios and listen to the conversations with other countries and not while the kids love that morse code station they yes <laughs> had the the alphabet up on the wall so they could see how to send their own names so it looks like uh it, you know, what you've cued us on here tonight i think is how to kind of focus on your your customer how to try to tailor it to what they best need and i think we uh we're going to take away a lot from this especially the fact we can go back and visit your site and get more information on that so i do yeah, appreciate the, all that um, the one thing i found that works well for those scout demonstrations is having a having fox hunting stuff we, yeah. we've, done that, we've done that a couple of times when we're doing out, outside activities to, to be able to have that activity can really engage them for a while Right. Because a yeah, lot of times, be, 
when you just set up Sorry. a table that they come by and they see the stuff and then they just sort of wander away because there's nothing physically to do. Yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we may not be as diversified as we'd like to be here. I don't know anybody in the club that's into fox hunting, but that would certainly be something maybe we should give a try at. In fact, I bought a little radio receiver for that, but I haven't put it together yet. <laughs> I can't. Uh, well, so I, I'll turn it over, see if anybody else has something to say. I, I think Keith has something. He has his hand up there. Go ahead, Keith. So Anthony, I just want to reiterate that was a fantastic presentation. Um, let me just tell you about myself. I'm operations director for a, a, a private school here in town, a medium-sized private school. I've been working there since 2007. And every year I teach a, uh, an extracurricular course, which is a one hour for nine weeks. I've mm -hmm. done small engine repair. I've done, uh, we built these little solar cars that would compete with other schools. So I was thinking about doing a radio one, of course, next year, because this year it's out of the question. Just teaching is a full-time chore. I understand. Know? Yeah. So I'm, I was thinking about putting something together for the fall. And honestly, I'm going to steal a lot of your stuff. Because, oh, please uh, do. Yeah. That's a, it, it's a very nice package you have there, you know, the presentation, all the you know, handouts, all the, 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 the activities. So yeah, this, uh, I just want to let you know that that, that it will help immensely. Um, Cause what I was thinking about doing before I saw the presentation was just getting some SDRs and maybe building some ladder line, uh, slim gym antennas and do, you know, trying to cob something together. But I think what you have the more comprehensive, uh, you know, array of activities will, will work much better for it's sixth grade to eighth grade is, uh, is that's a great it. age. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to say thank you. This couldn't have happened at a better time, your presentation. And it was just a great presentation. Well, and please feel free to contact me during the year or two when you're getting stuff ready. If you need any assistance or you want someone to ever make a contact with them, I'm happy to do that also. Okay, I appreciate that. And 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 as Tom said, and, and everyone's running through the same thing, this is really a good time to, this is really a bad time to actually do youth activities. But what I'm telling people, it's a good, a good time to start planning what you want to do when we can get back in person with people. So start dropping some of those hints. Also, I think that uh, there's a lot more receptiveness uh, among schools to being doing some remote things too. So that's another possibility of having some activities where you can do ports of these presentations remotely. It isn't quite the same thing. I know the one fifth grade I do every year, um, we're gonna do theirs via Zoom this year. Um, we're gonna do, I'm still gonna do the whole thing with them, but we're gonna do it via Zoom. But I, what I will have is I'll have access to my whole station here. So I'll be able to actually demonstrate the radio end of things a little bit easier from the house, but that's a group that I've already worked with a number of times, so it'll be easy to do. And that was very funny because I had, a, again, because it's the fifth grade, I don't expect anyone to get their license and it's only a one day out of the year. But I was doing a VE test about nine months later and one of the students looked at me and goes, Mr. Luskery, I was in your cl fifth grade class and my father had to get a license for, he, cause he's in, uh, oh, I forget that name of that new emergency preparedness program they have oh i can't remember the name of it but it's training and they were getting their technician class license so his father had to study for it so he told his father i want to study too and he did he got his he got his tech license but um so you never know when you're going to see these kids come back around through again um but please feel free to use any of the materials um anthony i'd like to Thank you again. I also mentioned that you're not just an expert on this subject. You have quite a few other uh, talks that are presentations that are on your website and stuff. So if you don't mind, I might come pick at you again sometime in the future. If we Certainly. I just, I just wrote two more this week. I did a AWR webinar last on this last Tuesday on um, what was oh, QSLing in a digital world. And then next Thursday, I'm doing one on uh, logging. Uh, electronic logging. I've already done one on uh, contesting introduction for them. And when they get everything straightened out and they get their new uh, electronic system that they're going to be instituting, there's already a class that I put together last year. It's a six, six module class on introduction to contesting that they're going to be rolling out. They actually have 10 classes to roll out whenever they get everything straightened out IT wise. 
So um, look for that coming out. But I, I have about eight or nine uh, talks that I do pretty regularly. This is talk four this week for a club. <laughs> well, we really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, good luck to you in your endeavors. You're doing a great yeah. job with the education, particularly. I, I can see that just from your talk. Other uh, questions? Yeah, anybody else? You might have to unmute. No, I guess. Well, anyway, uh, uh, you, you had, Anthony. Oh, there we go. Thank you. you had someone that just got their license fairly recently, didn't you? That's that's here tonight. Uh, Gordon Lichton, are, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Yeah, okay, Gordon, talking. I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share a link for you here. Actually, everyone can have this link, but I'm gonna share a link specifically for here you here in the chat. This is the talk I gave last night. Um, it's it's a talk on uh, things you can do with a technician class license. Oh, I'm an extra. Oh, you're an extra. So you don't. So you can go out and, you can go out and teach other people how to do these things. But I'm guessing that there's some things on here that you haven't done yet. Anyway, that's that's the good thing. I'm always. Well, Gordon just joined our club, and he's a, a really intelligent twelve year old that I never met, but I'm dying to meet him when this COVID thing goes away. And see, uh, find out how he got interested in ham radio. See, Gordon was very smart. He's like my nephew. My, when my nephew got his license and he came over to, to operate at my station, I could never remember where the general class band ended, you know, where the segments <laughs> ended. And I would, I, would, I would always have to look at the chart because I don't, I've been an extra for so long, I don't remember where the general class ends. So he, he, he wrote me an email a couple of weeks later. I think it was about three weeks later. He goes, uh, Uncle Anthony, I took care of that problem with the band edges. I just got my extra, so you don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's always a great thing about having your extra class license, not having to worry about where the band ends for for your set for your license class. Yeah, I remember that too. Well, well I've never I've never been to Tallahassee. The closest I've ever been is on Route 75, going, coming back from Florida. Actually, that's the last place. That's sort of like the last place I've ever been because we went to Hamcation last year. My wife and I drove down, got back here, and then you know what happened about. Two weeks later, yeah, I, I haven't driven more than a hundred, about two hundred miles since I got back from Florida last February. Well, whenever it's safe again, you're welcome to come to one of our live meetings whenever we resume them. If I ever Sometime. get down that way, yeah. You okay. miss it, so Florida. So this uh, is Paul Anthony. I just wanted to again thank you again for the great presentation, but also for the for the wealth of resources that's it's not wasn't just a great presentation but the way you embedded all the resources in and i i can see many of us looking at uh, you know at, at and, and utilizing and extending on these resources so thank you again oh you're very welcome okay another question I, stan stan yeah uh you, you mentioned hamcation yes uh, this isn't related to your presentation but i uh, i thought everybody would like to know that uh Hamcation this year is going to have uh, a QSO party, kind of like what the uh, what Dayton did last year. Dayton's going to do it again this year. Uh, they're, they're having a QSO party, and uh, 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 Orlando is going to be the focus of it, of course. But it's going to be anybody can work anybody, and the uh, exchange is going to be your name, state, and temperature. <laughs> there you are. So well, we can I'll, have the people I'll have up in uh, Maine seeing that our temperatures are nice. And I'll have an advantage because I only have to send one digit it. instead of two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I thought you were, I thought you were going to mention that at the, the Hamcation, the, the, they're going to be having online forums uh, in, in lieu of the, the forums there. So they're going to be doing like they're going to be doing forums and I'm actually doing a presentation on uh, something that Stan might have heard about before. It's called the State QSO Party Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be doing a presentation for the uh, Hamcation. So I'll stop by Tallahassee on my way down there in February. Unfortunately, not. It's going to be it's going to be uh, right here from my chair. But I'll be doing oh. that coming up. Anybody have any other questions for Anthony? No, if not, okay, Anthony. I guess we'll we'll uh, wrap it up here if you don't mind, because that's uh, fine. We could go on all night, but I know everybody's got to have jobs and things to do. So uh, thanks again very much. <laughs>
And uh, you're very welcome. And we'll hope to run across you again very soon, if not eye to eye, at least on another one of these Zoom meetings. So thank you. Uh, good night, everyone. Okay. Good night. I'll 73. Bye now.